Absolutely amazing lunch in a Korean barbecue today. Lots and lots of food for not a, a lot of money either. I don't think we'll do dinner properly tonight because we had much too much. Well, welcome again to Beyond the Podium, one of the celebrity life activities. And this afternoon, I'm going to talk about another one of the classical elements. That part of the classical element is going to go really short because there's not a lot to say about it. But there is a lot to say about air. And we are going to talk about the air we breathe. So, I always like to start off with something humorous. This is today's. And think about when these signs get put up. Generally, signs like this get put up because something happened. I'll let you read that. I think they have the right idea there, don't they? Poor animals. Did anybody go to the fish market today? Did anybody go to the international fish market today? which was not five minutes walk away from where they dropped us off. No, none of you went. I was there, not this voyage, previously when I was working in South Korea. And how can I put it? The international fish market that I saw in Busan makes the fish market we saw today look like a convenience store. My thought as I was walking around that market was, how come there are fish left in the sea? There were so many. All right, enough of humor. As I said, it's about the classical elements of air, and we'll dismiss it fairly quickly. According to Aristotle, air is one of the four fundamental elements that made up everything. This theory held sway for many years, and air was classified as being wet and hot. That classical element definition was translated into medicine, the four humors, and if you were sick, they would try and rebalance the elements in you, air in this particular case being wet and hot. Uh, they would try and dry you out, meaning diuretics, and being hot, cool you down, ice baths. Pleasant treatment. Enough of that. Right, what is air? Well, it's gaseous, it's a gas. It is one gas, is one of the four fundamental states of matter. We have gas, liquid, solid, and plasma. That last one you're probably not, perhaps not so familiar with. Plasma is the most abundant form of matter in the universe because that's what every star's made out of. And of course, there's lots of them. We do have plasma on, on, on Earth, but I'm digressing a little bit. I'll just give you one example of where we get plasma on Earth, and that's in a lightning strike. All right, back to air. It's made of atoms, it's made of elemental molecules, meaning something simple like oxygen or nitrogen here, or of, of some more complex molecules, compound molecules, that have got more than just a couple of atoms in there, say carbon dioxide uh, or ether when it's a vapor. And of course, in air, despite the fact when you move your hand you feel the air, there is a lot of empty space in air. And I will show you how much empty space as we go along. This is the composition of air, nominally. Lots of nitrogen, 20% or so oxygen, and then there's the rest of it. A bit of carbon dioxide, some argon, and others, so some other noble gases. There was a very interesting question that was asked of me in the science cafe the other day, and I gave an unsatisfactory answer to the particular questioner, which led me to the next slide. So we all know that our atmosphere is composed mostly of nitrogen and oxygen, and right here it is. But as we go higher up in the atmosphere, that is no longer true. And it looks like this. So this is height in kilometers. So at about 100 kilometers up, here's our 75, 78% uh, um, nitrogen. Nitrogen starts to drop off dramatically. Oxygen, too, the oxygen molecules also start to drop off dramatically. What are we getting? A huge rise in oxygen atoms. This is helium atoms. And we have nitrogen atoms just down here, not so many of them. So the question was concerning the aurora borealis. Why is it predominantly green? Green is the color of oxygen. And nitrogen gives other colors. And so you're thinking if the atmospheric composition is what it should be high up, then you should have predominantly nitrogen colors. And you don't, you get oxygen colors. And this is the reason. Because up there, where the aurora is, where that green band is, it's predominantly oxygen. So 
the atmospheric composition changes when you get really high. I want to talk very briefly about the nitrogen cycle. So we have a lot of this nitrogen in our air, which is seemingly useless. We just breathe it in, we breathe it out, it doesn't do anything. But you all know, of course, that nitrates are important fertilizers. And how do we convert this inert gas, nitrogen, into nitrates? Plants can't use it directly, as they can with carbon dioxide. So it is bacteria over here. There is bacteria that is responsible for taking that nitrogen out of the atmosphere and turning it into a chemical that can be used by living things, in this case plants, for the fertilizer. Very important. If we didn't have those bacteria, we couldn't use this nitrogen and we wouldn't have the growths we see today. This nitrogen cycle would be broken. So that's really very important. This is a slide I put in after somebody questioned me on this, and I must admit I didn't know the answer at that time, but you may have heard that putting nitrogen in your tires is better than just using compressed air. Have any of you heard that? Do any of you actually do it? Do you race? That's the only reason you should do it. Okay. So, yes, here it is down here for high performance. Nitrogen is actually way better than compressed air. Uh, in these other ones, you see that they're pretty much evenly balanced. And when it comes to cost and convenience, um, nitrogen is really not very cost effective nor very convenient. It is true that nitrogen leaks out of tires more slowly than compressed air. It is true that nitrogen is drier than compressed air, so it does decrease corrosion somewhat inside the wheel. But otherwise, it is somewhat of a myth that putting nitrogen in your tire really makes any difference. You will not feel any difference driving on nitrogen tires if your tires are fully inflated to the right level. Oxygen. So we're all familiar with oxygen. No oxygen, we wouldn't be here. Oxygen is two atoms of oxygen for the oxygen molecule. And I hope that everybody's heard of ozone. Ozone is created in the upper atmosphere and is responsible for getting rid of some of the more energetic ultraviolet rays that come from the sun. So this is ozone. Now, is there an O4? This is an O4. It's sort of like a, a ring, a square. Yes, there is. Under certain conditions, there is an O4. And there is indeed an O8 that looks like that. If you look at the phase diagram of oxygen, O8 is created under high temperature and high pressure. It is a red to black material. Obviously, we don't see this at room temperature. And interestingly, if you keep pressurizing um, oxygen and you keep the temperature uh, fairly constant, but, you know, I can see it here. So this is a very high pressure. Oxygen becomes a superconductor. It becomes metallic in its properties, but that's at very high pressures. This is solid liquid oxygen. Like liquid oxygen, it's blue. Has anybody ever seen liquid oxygen? No? I used to play with it in the lab sometimes. It's fun. It's also very dangerous if you drop a flame in it because it supports combustion. But yes, it's blue. This is ozone. It's a powerful oxidant. It's actually not very good for you. There are some machines that you know you can use to purify the air that they actually make ozone. Well, as long as the concentration of ozone is kept down, that's okay, because it can cause damage to the respiratory system if it exceeds more than 100 parts per billion there. It's a pale blue gas. It liquefies, as you can see here, at minus 112. There's liquid ozone. can be explosive, but as I said before, very useful because it protects us from the more energetic ultraviolet that comes from solar radiation. This is carbon dioxide. This is temperature down here. I know there's no numbers, it doesn't really matter. This is the surface of the Earth, this is pressure. So this is one atmosphere pressure here. So this is solid, and this is gaseous. And as you can see on that red line, at atmospheric condi conditions here on the surface of the Earth, when you have a piece of solid carbon dioxide, also known as dry ice, there is no liquid. You cannot have liquid carbon dioxide under normal conditions. It sublimates. It goes directly from solid to gas. It's only when you start 
increasing the pressure somewhere up here that we get liquid carbon dioxide. And then you have a normal process of melting to liquid and then a boiling of the liquid to a gas. But you will never observe that under uh, normal conditions. You've got to be in a lab to do that. Now, what about carbon dioxide? We're familiar with it. We breathe it in because it's present in the air. We create it in our bodies because we metabolize oxygen to carbon dioxide. Plants also breathe it out from their respiration, and they also use it in their photosynthesis. How innocuous is carbon dioxide? This chart shows us how innocuous carbon dioxide is, and it really isn't that innocuous. So this is color-coded. Where you see the green, these are the effects that occur when the concentration is as shown here. So this is the normal concentration. It's very low. It's 0.04%. If it rises up to a percent, you're going to start feeling drowsy. If it gets up to about 3%, these blue ones are going to start kicking in. We get up to 5%, say, you're confined in a room and you're breathing out carbon dioxide and the concentration is raising, or is rising and rising. When we get to 5%, you're going to start to get confused, you're going to have a headache, you're going to have some other uh, problems, shortness of breath, of course. If we get up to 8%, you will go unconscious, your body will be sweating, your muscles will be tremoring, um, you'll have little seizures, and of course, if the concentration continues to rise, i.e. above 8%, then you are dead. It's poisonous to you. So not so innocuous. Other components of our atmosphere are the noble gases. So these are the noble gases, helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, and radioactive radon. There is a new element that's been uh, discovered. They've only made a few atoms of it. It is in the same period as the noble gases, but unfortunately we've only made a few atoms of it, so we really don't know anything about it. And that's uh, organoson, element 118. So these are the concentrations in the atmosphere in parts per million. So you see helium. Yes, there's some there. There is more neon. There is a lot more argon. And there's not very much krypton and there's even less xenon. And these are the colors of the noble gases when an electric uh, field is put on the gas. So that's what they look like. Let me talk a little bit more about this one, radon. Have you heard of radon? No. I see a no there. Has anybody else heard of radon? All four of you. Very good. So the rest of you, I guess, are either going to be non-committal or you haven't heard of it. Well, in the United States, and in Canada for that matter, it is the second leading cause of lung cancer after smoking. And as smoking diminishes, as it continues to do, at least in North America, radon is going to become the leading cause of lung cancer. And where does this radon come from? because it is radioactive, and that means it decays. It doesn't stick around very long. In fact, radons have very short half-lives, or just a matter of days. Well, they're generated from a natural decay chain of either uranium or thorium, and so depending on the geology of where you live, you will have radon in varying amounts. I'm pretty sure that almost every home in North America will have some level of radon in the home. It's going to come in through the sump pump, it's going to come in through cracks in the foundation, and because our homes are so well insulated, it stays there. So this is the idea here, uranium decays to radium, then you get some radon, and it gets into the home. And as you can see, the yearly deaths attributable to radon, somewhere between 15 to 22,000 per year. Krypton, not radioactive. Um, not very common in the atmosphere, only about one part per million. I'll tell you why I'll talk about this one in a minute. You can extract this out of the air by a process known as fractional distillation, as you can with some of the other noble gases, and that's what it looks like with an electric field on it. Why am I talking to you about krypton? Well, I'm talking to you about krypton because at one point, krypton was the standard by which they measured one meter. Originally, one meter was a piece of metal in Paris. 
This is one meter on a wall. This is the standard meter in the laboratory in Paris. But they decided, no, uh, the metal wasn't good enough, even though it was pretty robust, to actually standardize the meter. They were going to standardize the meter based on the wavelength of uh, light emitted from this particular isotope. So that's the number of wavelengths that actually made, made up one meter. It sounds a bit convoluted, and indeed, I guess they thought so too, because this was 1960, because a little bit later, then in 1983, they redefined it, and now they defined it in terms of the path length of light in a vacuum using a helium neon laser, so that's the wavelength of that particular laser. So one meter then was dis dif defined as the distance the light traveled of that laser in that number of seconds, which is a very small number. But that's how one meter is defined today. So back to argon and krypton again. They're actually used in windows to help with insulation. So these numbers here show you the conductivity of air, argon, and krypton. The higher the number, the more heat is conducted from one side of the window to the other. So in double glazed windows, if you fill them with air, the convection here allows the heat to travel from that side of the window to that side of the window. The higher that number, the more heat will go that way. And as you can see, uh, argon is about, well, I, I say half. No, it's a little bit more than half of what air can do. But krypton is about a third of what air can do. Now, more expensive, these windows will cost you more money, but they are very much better insulators if you're worried about heat coming in or leaving your house. So good insulators. Xenon. Now this is a cloud of radioactive material in this animation. This cloud of radioactive material is emanating from North Korea, where we're close to. If we measure these two isotopes with very sensitive equipment, I'll show you where these are located in a second, we can say something about where a nuclear explosion took place, because the ratio of these two tells you how old that particular pocket of gas is, and then using air transport models, we can backtrack and figure out where stuff came from. So this is, in fact, a concentration scale here. The, uh, the mauve purple color there is the highest concentration, and we have the orange less. And these are powers of 10. The green is less again, and the blue is less, and then we're down to this color. And then, yes, it originated uh, in this area. And this is part of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty Organization, which is what CTBTO stands for. And those stations are all over the world. In fact, in Canada, we have a number. When I was working at the Radiation Protection Bureau, we had one station on the roof of our building. Uh, we have one in Vancouver, we have one in Halifax, and there's one somewhere up in the north. These, is, these are the locations of the CTBT stations. They don't all measure radioactivity. Some of them are um, seismic stations, so they're measuring essentially earthquakes. Now, the signature from an earthquake is different from the signature from a nuclear explosion, so that you can tell whether a nuclear explosion has taken place by looking at the signature of what was detected by the seismic station. Once you've seen that, you can alert the air monitoring stations to be on the lookout for things, and then we can measure things like the xenon isotopes in the air to know if something took place. And as you can see, they're pretty much all over the place. So the red ones, there, 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 and there, and others throughout the world are the ones that measure radionuclides, where you see the inverted triangle and that was one, that was my building there, uh, then that is a more advanced station for measuring these, these radionuclides. If you have two gases and you're able to separate them and you put them in a room and you put a wall up and you leave a gap, then they're going to mix. And this animation shows you how they mix. And this is how gases move around. This is diffusion. The atoms are bouncing around. So while we started off with green down here, in sort of uh, magenta color up there. Uh, you just let them diffuse for a while, and then they're all mixed up. And so this is how gases travel. 
They just threw diffusion, you know, bouncing around. Breathing. Obviously, air is something very important to us as we breathe. This is one of the few functions that you can control. One of the few functions that's both conscious and unconscious, and you can control it um, consciously, or you can even do it a little bit unconsciously. When you eat food, you have to have a certain amount of oxygen coming in to help metabolize that food. One of the products of the food, of course, is energy, but one of the waste products is carbon dioxide. And this is a complicated process and something that's been studied for a great deal of time. We'll get to the studies in a second. So for the major groups here, and I added alcohol as a major group because I'm sure some of you enjoy that food group, this is the amount of energy that's released when you uh, metabolize that in kilocalories per gram. Uh, this is the amount of oxygen that you need in liters per gram of this material to metabolize it. And then this is the amount of CO2 that will come out from those materials, having metabolized it with the oxygen in the air. So this is the nominal basal metabol metabolism. And this is why we say that human beings are approximately the same as a 100-watt light bulb. It's actually 87 watts on this slide, but that is the amount of heat that you are putting out. It is essentially that as a 100-watt light bulb. I mean, I know when I cuddle up to my wife at night, she's nice and warm. Yes, 100-watt light bulb. Sometimes you're 150 watts. 200 even. You're not meant to understand this, but I want to show you the complexity of the metabolic processes in the human body that have been mapped out. Isn't science wonderful that we understand all this, all the different metabolic processes that go on in the body? It's extremely complicated. Enough of that. Right. How does air move? We can't see it but we can trace it by using other tools. We can trace it, say, by using some smoke, as shown in the example here. I've generated a bit of smoke, and you can see how the air is moving around in that locale. If you have smoke coming out of a smokestack, it tells you something about the air movement of a larger air mass. And indeed, if you look up in the sky and you look at the clouds moving, then it tells you something about how that air is moving up in the higher uh, altitudes. I like this picture because we've got the smoke from this smokestack going this way. So this air mass is traveling across that direction. And then in the higher chimney, we've got smoke coming out going this way. So the air currents up there are going in the opposite direction. Unfortunately, I didn't take that photograph. I wish I could. Every time I see two smokestacks, I'm forever looking at them, hoping that I'll see the smokes go in a different way. But then, of course, I'm generally driving, so it wouldn't really be safe to be able to take that photograph, would it? So you can tell how air is moving. This is Chernobyl. You all heard of Chernobyl? This is the emissions from Chernobyl. This is the particle height. So blue is ground level, or as black is almost ground level, going up to a red, which is 600 meters in height six kilometers. This is the cesium-137 deposition in uh, becquerels per square meter that comes in at the end of the animation that shows you how the particles deposited. So that showed you how that plume moved around, and it's going to rerun again. So this is a th this time stamp when that occurred, and obviously the way this moved is due to the air that was moving that stuff around. So this is how the air was moving, being reconstructed through air modeling. So if we look at the world in general, if something is released, say, here in the east coast of North, uh, North America, it's going to take about two weeks to travel to the other side of Asia, basically just on the latitude. To travel north and south to about the equator level or the North Pole, it's going to take somewhere between one and two months to be able to get up there. And to cross the equator and to go into the southern hemisphere, it's going to take about a year to do that. But eventually, 
what is released from that particular point, in this case too, Chernobyl, what was released from Chernobyl, went absolutely everywhere in differing amounts. We certainly saw it did in the Northwest Territories of Canada. So here's Europe. There's Europe. Chernobyl's over there. We saw depositions up here in the Northwest Territories from Chernobyl sometime later. And this shows you, again, how something may rise up into the atmosphere, be blown across, and then rain will bring it out, or the particles will come out, they'll collide with each other, they'll get heavier, and they will fall. The movement of air can be very dramatic, in fact, and this photograph shows you how dramatic air movement can be. <coughs> a tornado or a hurricane can do this. And as you can see, there's a spar of wood that has been driven right through a tree. So just imagine the force of the wind that was able to pick up that piece of wood and drive it through the tree. Some people actually do this. They go chase these storms to try and figure out what they're like. I don't think I'd like to be standing on this road as that thing comes towards me. That's an F5 tornado that would pick us up and throw us away and we'd be history. This is Hurricane Katrina seen from space. And this was its after effect, of course, and most of this was storm surge. It wasn't rain. The winds whipping up the sea and blowing them into the land and over the land. And this is a Category 3 hurricane, again, showing you what the air can do as it moves. That mass of air and just blowing everything everything away. And of course, if you're standing in the way of something that is in that wind, then the impact could be disadvantageous to you, to say the least. This is our atmosphere. When you look at the planet from a distance, it gets even thinner. Just this little thin band of air around our planet that we can see. And this is the composition that we're familiar with, the 78% nitrogen, the oxygen, and then the other gases here in the lower, in the lower part of the atmosphere. This is only true up to 100 kilometers. Above 100 kilometers, that's no longer true, as I already said to you. It's different. These are the different bands that we have classified our atmosphere into, the troposphere, the tropopause, the stratosphere, there's the ozone layer, which is so nicely protecting us from UV, the mesosphere, the ionosphere. And then above the ionosphere, extending as high as 10,000 kilometers, there is still something that we know as the exosphere, where we find most of the helium around our planet is up there. Now down here, which is only going up to about 10, 14 kilometers, depending where you are on the surface of the Earth, the bulk of the atmosphere is there. The bulk of the air is in that lower level. 75% of the mass is there. 99% of all the aerosols and the water vapor is here in this level. And of course, if you get above that, it gets, um, it gets difficult to breathe. So here's the, the boundaries. This is the temperature as we go higher. So there's 10 kilometers. The temperature drops down to about minus 80. The pressure drops as we go up. And that's a log scale. I'll show you more pressure in a minute go up to 30 kilometers, there's 50 kilometers, uh, it's risen somewhat. So notice how the temperature goes down, then it goes up, it goes down, and then it goes up again. It really depends on where you are in the atmosphere as to what the temperature is. Now, the air actually weighs something. If you take a column of air here, this column of air, which is one meter square, say a yard if you don't think meters, so a yard square, and you've got that column going all the way up, then that's the mass, and that's pressing down on you, giving the air pressure that we experience. So typically, one atmosphere in the old unit, it's 14 pounds per square inch, a little bit more, or in the SI unit, just over 100 kilopascals. That's pressure at sea level. As you go up, that pressure decreases. So this is the weight of the atmosphere, lots of it, but it's very small, of course, when you compare it to the Earth. We are losing air. The energy from the sun 
comes down, it excites air molecules in two ways. One of the ways is to give energy to the molecules themselves and accelerate them. Uh, they have enough energy, they can escape the planet's gravity. The other way that we are losing air, and it varies on what the gas is, of course. The lighter the gas is, the quicker they go away. Uh, they are lost in a wind. So, in fact, a whole bunch of molecules will get energy from the sun and they'll just be blown off and they'll go faster than um, the escape velocity. They can also be blown out in other ways. If an asteroid impacts the atmosphere, it will knock air out. It doesn't have to hit the Earth, it just has to impinge on the atmosphere, and then at the top it will knock out molecules and we'll lose air that way too. So we are losing air. We actually lose them during auroras too. This is a plume here where we're losing air. This is the aurora borealis, and this is the plume where we're actually losing molecules. So based on the temperature of our, our planet and the escape velocity here, we will lose gases. So Earth is here, so everything below this we can keep. Uh, we don't have very much of these two because we're not massive enough. And of course, as the planet gets smaller, so here's the moon, it really can't keep very much at all, and in fact is airless. It could have some xenon there, but it wouldn't keep anything else. There's not enough for it. So this is the breakdown of the mass of the atmosphere. As I said to you, at about 14, 10, 10 kilometers, about 75%. So you go a little bit higher, you've got 90%. 90 you go up to 100 kilometers, and you, most of the mass is there, although we still, there's still stuff higher and higher and higher. To put this in perspective with the amount of atmosphere you've got, here's Mount Everest at 8.8 .8 kilometers high, and this is how high planes fly at about 10 kilometers. So that puts you in perspective on how much atmosphere you've got below you. So is it any wonder then when people climb Everest, most of the time they need oxygen? Uh, supplements to do it. This is the atmospheric mass density, so this is the density as we sit here, and this is a thousand times less at an altitude of 50 kilometers. This is a log scale, so this is a thousand times below that, this is a thousand times below that, and that's a thousand times below that. So it's plummeting rapidly, so as we get up higher and higher, there's a hundred kilometers so that's a million times less dense at that position in height. This is the temperature, fairly constant, till we start to get up to about that 100 mark, and then the temperature is increasing. The atmosphere does other things too. The gases in the atmosphere absorb different radiations that come from the sun. It would be a very grim world if our atmosphere absorbed visible light. Think about that for a second. You see me because visible light is bouncing off me. If there was no visible light coming in from the sun outside and we couldn't generate artificial light, then you wouldn't see anything. In fact, the air in here, if it absorbed visible light, you wouldn't see that. It would probably absorb all the light before it got to the screen. So fortunately, this is transparent. There's the visible light. The atmosphere doesn't absorb very much. This is 100% opacity, meaning it absorbs everything. So as we go lower there, or high, higher in frequency, so there's the ultraviolet band here. You see some of it gets through, but a lot of it is absorbed. The cosmic ray is largely absorbed. And then over here in the infrared, some of it comes down, some of it's absorbed. As we get higher into microwave regions, there's a big channel here where we can have microwaves and long wave, long wave radio waves. But in the ultimate up in the really long wave radio waves, they're blocked. The atmosphere will absorb all of those. So that's because of the different properties of the gases. So it just works out convenient for us. Well, of course, we've evolved that way, right? If this had been blocked and this was transparent, our eyes probably would have evolved, evolved to use higher wavelengths. So the atmosphere on planet Earth has changed. It has not always been what it is today. Originally, hydrogen and helium, water, methane, and ammonia. That would have been the original atmosphere. The hydrogen and helium would have been lost very quickly in Earth's early days, so we're talking billions of years ago now, probably when the Earth was still a very hot place, because when it was formed, it was a very hot place. The surface would have been almost molten. 
a very unpleasant place to be in the early days. But of course, as it cooled, things improved. The second phase would have been mostly nitrogen and carbon dioxide. Notice there's no oxygen there. If you went back that far, you would suffocate. You wouldn't survive. But late after, we have nitrogen and oxygen. And it's, of course, the oxygen that allows living things to do just that, which is live. So there's early Earth, still hot. And then we've moved through different phases. This is what it actually looks like. This is time in billions of years. So this is the nitrogen concentration. There's the methane and ammonium. We don't really know in the very, very early days what it was. Uh, Earth was hot in these days. And you can see how the, the levels have changed. So notice here, oxygen has only started building in at that point. In fact, we can look at oxygen a bit more closely here. So oxygen was very low for a very long time, going back 650 million years. And after um, life started to form at these low levels of oxygen, oxygen started to rise. And notice it has not been constant. And even today, the oxygen levels are not constant. They are changing slightly. In fact, they're changing the way you don't want them to. They're going down, but not very much. But don't take it for granted. This is what ozone looks like. So smog ozone down here that we generate as we go higher and higher, up around 25 kilometers, we've got the maximum ozone layer. You remember, of course, some years ago, the problems with the ozone hole in the south, and the, well, mostly the south, that ozone hole that we had created by putting uh, fluorocarbons into our atmosphere and making the air polluted. Well, largely that's fixing itself and the hole is getting smaller. So this is what ozone does. This is the ozone concentration here. It's rising. So there's about 25, 30 there. So at the peak there, we have UVA, which is transparent. That gives you uh, some tanning. The UVB here, uh, which gives you sunburn and is also ionizing. So it can lead to skin cancers. Some of it is getting through. If there was no ozone, a lot more UVB would be getting through, and it would be a very nasty place. You wouldn't want to be out in the sun very long at all. And UVC is completely blocked by ozone. And if there was no ozone at all, some UVC would get down to the Earth's surface. And that is a very energetic form of UV and would be very harmful to all living things. Boyle's Law, I just want to touch on this. In 1662, Boyle noticed something very interesting. And what he noticed was if he compressed a gas at a fixed volume and he changed it, um, and he changed the pressure and he changed the volume, then the two things equaled each other. So pressure, some pressure here, some volume there. You take a product of those two, and we have a different pressure over here with a different volume. And lo and behold, it's the same number. Well, wasn't that something to discover that? Can you imagine how he felt when he discovered it? So that's the actual formula that the product of this actually equals the product of that. And that was the discovery of the gas law. And so that was Boyle. So how many molecules do we have, say? So I did this calculation. Let's take a room that's 5 meters by 5 meters by 3 meters, put it into the old units, 15 feet by 15 feet by 9 feet, assume default conditions, which is standard temperature and pressure. How many molecules do we have? Well, that's the number of molecules you've got in that amount of air. It weighs 97 kilos in that, if you were to take it as a lump. If you pack it closely together, you're going to get this in cubic meters. So somewhere between 0.03 and 0.05 cubic meters. What does that mean? That means that almost all of the room is empty space. It's 99.87% of that room, if you remove those molecules, is empty. So most of this room is empty, even though we can feel something, because they're moving around quickly. How fast do they go? It depends on temperature. This is velocity. So this is standard temperature, 27 degrees centigrade, say. It's 422 meters per second. I've given you the translation there in kilometers per hour and miles per hour. This is how fast molecules are moving. And as you increase the temperature, then everything moves over to the right, and the velocities get faster, because they're getting hotter. 
and this is how they move. And they're move, moving really quick. So those air molecules that you feel as you move your hand, you're, you're feeling air molecules when you do this, then they're moving really fast. How close are they? Well, how far does an air molecule travel before it hits another one? Because I just told you most of it's empty space, right? So you think maybe they have to go a really long distance, but no, in fact not. It's a really short distance. It's measured in um, 10 to the minus 6 of a centimeter. You can't even see that. It's so small. It's traveling a very small distance before it hits another one because they're traveling so fast, they bump into each other. So in one cubic centimeter, that's how many molecules there are, and that's how many collisions per per square centimetre per second there are. Lots and lots of collisions taking place, which is why you feel things. This is why there's pressure, too. They're bouncing into you. Pressure again. Remember, we've got this column that's pressing down on you. And so this is for one square centimetre. So that's very small. But if you average this over your entire body, then the amount of weight of air pressing down upon you, giving you the air pressure that we're able to deal with, is equivalent to the weight of a small car. Can you believe that? You've got a small car sitting on top of you all the time because of air pressure. This is how pressure changes with atmosphere. So this is measured in kilopascals, which is the SI unit. So altitude, sorry. So as we go higher and higher, of course, the pressure goes lower and lower. So this is 2,000 meters, 2 kilometers, up to 10 kilometers high. So 100 kilopascals, and we've dropped down to um, 25 there. So a factor of 4 in terms of pressure. And of course, as you go up then, that has an impact. This is a little experiment you can try if you're flying. Get yourself uh, a water bottle, empty it, seal it up in the plane, and then look at it when you land. And this is what happened here. This bottle was sealed up in a plane. That was the altitude of 4,000 meters, 14,000 feet. And as it came down to 2,700 meters, 9,000 feet, it kind of looked like that. And when it got down to 300 meters or 1,000 feet, uh, it looked like that. And you'll see that in a plane. It will squash. Any wonder that things happen in your luggage? when the pressure changes, things can leak. As you go higher and higher, then water will boil at a lower temperature. And in fact, it used to be used uh, as a measure of altitude. If they measured the temperature of what water boiled at, then they could relate that to air pressure, which would tell them roughly the height they were. So this was one way that people figured out where they were in terms of altitude, was boiling water, seeing what temperature it boiled at. And as they had a chart, of course, uh, realizing that a, a lower temperature one meant you were higher, uh, then they could figure out how high they were. And eventually, of course, if you went to the extreme and there was no pressure whatsoever, water would just completely spontaneously go away and boil because you wouldn't have to supply very much at all. So the fact it's 100 degrees at, at sea level doesn't mean it's going to be that as you move higher. No, it's lower. Flying. Flying is something that is very difficult to explain sometimes to people. Uh, Newton's third law of motion used to be used to try and describe this, and that's not really what it is. It is Bernoulli's principle uh, that tells us that uh, a high, a faster airstream will create a lower pressure above an aerofoil, which gives you the lift on an aeroplane. You don't really have to know how that actually works to fly. Um, the engineers just need to know that things like that do work, and then they can build them. They don't really need to know the physics behind it, which is kind of interesting, I think. Sound, well, without air, you wouldn't hear me because that how it is sound is propagated, it is a wave motion that's going through the air. And then your eardrums pick up that wave, they vibrate, and that is translated into sound in your brain, and that's how you understand me. If there was no air, there would be no sound. In space, nobody can hear you scream. I'm sure you're familiar with that expression. It comes from alien. These are some factors that affect it. I don't have to go through those. You can read that for yourself. There are different factors that affect the way it takes place. 
So this shows you altitude here, and this shows you the speed of sound, and you see it's related to temperature. It's not related to density, it's not related to pressure. It has a complex arrangement with temperature. It does, of course, make a difference what the medium is, so if we change the medium from air to something else, then the speed of sound indeed, indeed would be affected as it is in, say, water. This is liquid air. It gets this color mainly from the oxygen. That's the specifications for it, where it boils and freezes. Don't have to say any more about that. I want to say something about this very briefly. This is the air quality index that you might be familiar with. And obviously, the higher this air quality index gets, the worse it is. We want a low value for an air quality index. This is today's air quality index in this area, which I got off the web today. China, Korea, Japan. It was a miracle we saw any stars last night. And in fact, anything on the horizon, we didn't, because the air quality is pretty poor in this area. Then I just want to wrap up now with air in art. This is rather something interesting. This is a guy using LED sticks. He throws them up into the air, and he gets these fantastic patterns as the sticks move around. The air, of course, driving the waves, pushing the ships over. Uh, this is a 1700 pa painting of some ships at sea. Appropriate seeing as we're at sea, but this doesn't happen to cruise ships. Don't worry about that. This is another one. The gust of wind where you see the air moving the trees through the molecules, striking those leaves and pushing them. Because the air can do that. And then this is one of my favorites. This actually, a copy of this hangs in my bedroom. This is the, an experiment on a bird. It's by John Joseph Wright of Derby. So there's a bird in a sphere here. There's a vacuum pump over here. And the scientist, philosopher, he was called in those days, has evacuated the sphere there, removing the air. And of course, when you remove air, what happens? You can't breathe, and it looks like the bird dies. He will then let the air back into the sphere. This is things they used to do in these times, by the way. This is, this is kind of reality. And you can see the expressions on the faces of the people as he's explaining this and doing this experiment. I think it's an absolutely magnificent painting, one of my favorites. And that brings me to the end of air. Thank you. We have a sea day tomorrow. Tomorrow I'm going to talk about radiation. And I'm going to have, do stand up, the dog Q&A workshop. <laughs>